we trust that this will be a very fruitful uh, engagement. Now we've come to a very important segment of the engagement and to do justice to that will be Mrs. Deborah Jinfra who will be telling us the importance and the purpose of this meeting. So over to you, Madam. Good morning all, welcome to this meeting. Just as the Director General said, this video inviting all of you all, he stressed the importance of the relationship SEC has with GSIA. And in getting to these guidelines, we followed that principle in sharing the drafts of these guidelines with GSIA. We noted your comments, we took them into consideration, and finalize the guidelines. And indeed, it was at the GSIA AGM that the DG announced that the guidelines would be issued, and the guidelines were issued. So today, we are here to go through the guidelines with you, and any other pressing issues that you want to bring to the attention of the Commission. So once again, we look forward to a fruitful deliberation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam. So. We can see that there has been a lot of engagement leading up to this point. And this platform will present an opportunity for a deep dive into the guidelines. Now I'd like to also introduce the main speaker for the event, and he happens to be a giant in the industry. So I'm really happy with the quality we have here and the deepness, the deepness of uh, the bench that we have today. So in introducing the speaker, I have to say that first and foremost, he's a senior minister of the gospel. He's also the chairman of the West African Securities Regulators Association, WASRA, the chairman of the Ghana Investments and Securities Institute, the member of the board of the National Pensions Regulatory Authority, NPRA, and also a member of the Financial Stability Advisory Council in Ghana. Perhaps most importantly for this meeting, he happens to also be the Director General for the Securities and Exchange Commission. So without much ado, let me invite Reverend Daniel Ogbamitete to give us a presentation. Okay. Please expect a short break before the presentation. Thank you. I'd like to say good morning to all of you, um, members of the Governing Council and all the distinguished members of the Ghana Securities Industry Association. And let me thank you for making the time uh, to be part of uh, this edition that we have um, labeled Time with the Commission. Let me also apologize for the initial difficulties uh, with regard to the voice. I am hoping that with what my technical team have been able to sort out, the sound is better. In case you are still having difficulties uh, with the sound, you can kindly uh, send a message and um, our technical team would see how they would be able to work around to resolve it. Uh, but, you know, in these times, um, post-COVID, when we're all going uh, digital and online in our meetings, uh, you can expect that these challenges would occur from time to time. But I, I am confident that we'll, we'll be able to have a good meeting um, today. As has already been said, the agenda really is to go over the guidelines that we have recently issued. You recall that during the last annual general meeting of the GSIA, I indicated that we'll be issuing some guidelines. We issued four guidelines uh, in all, one to do with licensing, licensing guidelines. Uh, we issued one on conduct of business uh, guidelines. Uh, we issued the regulatory sandbox licensing guidelines. And then we also worked or uh, issued the corporate governance code. And that's more for the listed companies. 
in today's event, we'll be focusing on two of the guidelines. That is the licensing guidelines and then the conduct of business guidelines. I will not go through all the provisions in it. I'll be highlighting some aspects that we can focus the discussion on. And I trust that um, we can then have some engagement um, with you if you have some questions that you would um, want to have. So the um, areas for um, discussion, we'll be looking at why we came up with the guidelines and um, we'll look at the fit and proper principle. We'll look at the minimum capital requirement, and then we'll look at the statutory um, notifications. On this slide, we just remind you of who we are. Of course, you know who we are, but I think maybe in terms of our vision, which we have restated and our mission, we'd like to just um, you know, share it again with you. Our vision is to be a top tier securities market regulator in Africa. That means that the industry must also be top tier. And that's why we believe that these guidelines and other uh, initiatives that we'll be bringing to the market would work towards achieving that goal. Our mission, which really it's, is uh, taken from uh, section two of our Enabling Act uh, 929 is to regulate, innovate, and promote the growth and development of an efficient, fair, and transparent securities market in which investors and the integrity of the market are protected. If you look in the act, you don't see the word innovate, but you find that in our vision, we have innovate there. And that speaks volumes to our commitment as a, a regulatory body to see the market develop. And we stand ready to support innovation. And indeed, the regulatory sandbox license is designed to support such uh, innovative ideas that you, the market players, uh, you know, that's what you are best at. So we, we, we are here to ensure that we provide the enabling environment for the securities industry in Ghana to develop. In terms of some of the reasons or the rationale for the, um, the, the guidelines, um, clearly, after we had our new act, as the Act 929 uh, um, issued, we needed to have the regulations to back it because there are some new areas that um, requires the uh, regulatory framework to be in place. Of course, we have issued some of these guidelines in uh, the previous uh, years, but you know we need to fix all the gaps. Again, if you look at some of the challenges that uh, ha, you know, have come up in the past uh, year and a half, uh, which if you like uh, precipitated the sanitization, uh, a, a number of gaps you know, clearly uh, came up. And we trust that these guidelines will help, especially if you look at the fit and proper principle, you look at the conduct of business guidelines when it comes to the corporate governance provisions in there. So basically, we are looking at how we identify and fix uh, the gaps, how to make sure that we are putting the industry on a stronger pedestal to function. And then, of course, we have been hinting about the minimum capital requirement uh, for a number of years now. And uh, so we have finally issued it and we have also given an indication of the implementation um, timeline. Then we have the adherence to the fit and proper. Uh, we, we are looking at how we can raise the bar when it comes to the integrity of the market operators and what we can do to boost the market uh, development. Now, looking at the fit and proper uh, principle, which you find in 
the licensing guidelines. So uh, we are starting with the licensing guidelines and then we will later get to the conduct of business guidelines. Now, um, if you look at our LI 1728, this fit and proper principle is not that well amplified, but it's very clear to us that it's an important principle to focus on. I've said before that licensing is what gives you the uh, opportunity to operate in the industry in the first place. And one of the ways we protect the investors is to make sure that those who are coming into the market, those who are given the license to operate, they are fit and they are proper. So in the licensing guidelines that we have issued, you find that there is a part that deals with some of the things that we'll be looking at to determine whether an, a potential applicant or even an existing applicant is fit and proper to hold the license from the commission and to operate in the uh, industry. So uh, we, the, the, uh, on this slide, we, we have highlighted about five of them and you see on the next slide, maybe about three more of the elements that will feed into determining whether uh, an applicant is fit and proper to hold a license. So we'll look at the financial status or solvency. We'll look at ability to carry on regulated um, activity competently, honestly, and fairly. Very important. Competence is important. Honesty is important and being fair. And, um, you know, it's one of the things that will feed into who is fit and who is proper. We'll also be looking at whether the applicant has contravened any provisions uh, in the law, especially when it comes to the issue of protection for investors. We'll look at, of course, educational uh, qualification. We'll look at the experience, relevant experience, because all that feeds into uh, fit and proper. Of course, if you are going to see, seek medical uh, help, uh, if uh, let's say a surgical or medical procedure is going to be conducted on you, you want to make sure that uh, the one who is going to do it is qualified, has a re requisite training, has a requisite uh, experience. Okay, so the next slide uh, continues with the um, elements of the fit and proper. Uh, we also have to look at the fact whether the um, the applicant has taken part in any fraudulent um, or improper business uh, conduct or some conduct that, um, you know, leads to, you know, serious question marks being raised on, on, on the credibility of uh, the way the applicant conducts business. We'll have to take a look um, at, at that. We also have to look at um, whether the, um, the applicant in terms of, um, you know, conduct of business uh, has conducted himself in such a manner that raises serious doubts when it comes to competence, when it comes to soundness of uh, judgment. We also want to look at whether the applicant has established the requisite internal controls or procedures, risk management measures uh, to ensure compliance with all applicable regulatory requirements. So, so basically, um, we, we, we are just going to make sure that not just anyone who comes through, um, you know, our application process would uh, be giving a license. Um, so we, we shared with the market the levels, and uh, after we got feedback from the market, we adjusted a number of the levels downward. So in the release that we um, came up with, I don't think there were any uh, surprises because um, the, the numbers that we shared with you, um, we took the feedback and we adjusted, maybe not to the level that the GSIA requested, but we did some uh, downward adjustment. 
Now, let me mention one thing that uh, you might have observed in this uh, particular licensing guidelines. Now, typically, when we give you an indication of the minimum capital requirement, we also give you an indication of the licensing fees that is applicable. Now, what we said in this particular guideline is that the licensing fees would be announced uh, you know, or set from time to time by the commission. Now, maybe let me just give a little explanation. If you look in the LI 1728, you would notice that the licensing fees for the different licenses, um, it, it's, it's a percentage of the minimum capital that is required. And we actually uh, sought to maintain the same structure in this particular licensing guidelines. However, we had to hold on with the um, licensing fees because there is a general uh, direction uh, within the uh, economy for a, a freeze on various fees and charges that um, can be levied within the economy. So because of that, we have taken out the licensing fees, uh, which will be a percentage of the minimum capital requirement. So once we get the approval to implement um, our licensing fee regime, we will announce to the market um, the, the levels, but the explanation is that it's a percentage of the minimum capital required. I think for those of you who applied for uh, your licenses to be renewed this year, um, you know, you all paid the fees that you have uh, been paying and we didn't raise any objection. We received it and then we uh, went ahead to renew the uh, license. But I'm just informing you that um, in the uh, coming months, uh, we'll be issuing some guide, some guidance in terms of how the licensing fees would be situated. But we will not depart from the principle of having it as a percentage of the minimum capital required for the um, respective licenses. Uh, so you can you can check um, our our LI 1728 uh, and study the relationship between um, the licensing fees and then the minimum capital required. The other thing I'd like to highlight about the minimum capital required is that we, when we came up with the announcement, we did say that we will give the market operators uh, who are currently um, within the industry, or currently operating within the industry, we'll give them up to the end of December 2021, <clears throat> the end of December 2021, to be fully compliant with uh, this particular um, guideline with respect to the minimum capital uh, required. Now, what we will recommend and what we would advise is that where you currently fall below the minimum capital required, you need to quickly put together a plan because we are going to require that of you, a plan of action that you are going to follow between now and the end of December 2021 on how you are going to meet the, um, the current the current uh, level. So that is important. I think I did a quick check from uh, my funds management uh, team and my understanding is that about 53% of the uh, fund managers are below the threshold. And so it means that there's some work for the uh, fund managers uh, to do to make sure that 
they meet the new minimum capital required, provided that is if they want to continue operating in the uh, industry. And I think that it, it should be possible for um, fund managers to consider all options, not to take any option from the table. And when I say all options, uh, we have already had some people approaching um, us about um, uh, merging. And so th those are options that can be explored uh, in the quest to meet the minimum capital uh, requirement. But the point is where you fall below the threshold that we have set will require you to submit a plan. And we are gonna monitor the plan because we want to make sure that we are tracking your progress towards being uh, compliant. Uh, another option may be, for instance, if you're a fund manager, uh, you might decide that, well, you might just want to operate at another level, for instance, as an investment advisor, uh, where the minimum capital required is lower. But it, it's a decision that you have to make. But the point is, by the end of December 2021, we are expecting that um, everyone will be uh, fully compliant. The licensing um, guidelines also has uh, provisions regarding um, notifications that uh, are mandatory, uh, you know, where your operations are concerned. We have listed a number of them. I am not going to uh, go through them, but take note that um, when you fail to comply um, with these guidelines, um, you position yourself uh, to receive, um, let me say, um, the requisite uh, sanction that uh, we have in our, our toolkit. So uh, that does it for the um, session on the um, the licensing guidelines, and we are going straight to the conduct of business guidelines. And I'm quite big on the conduct of business guidelines because uh, one of the factors that led to the challenge, especially in the asset management industry, um, which we are still in the process of resolving, has to do with corporate governance. So the, the conduct of business guidelines addresses corporate governance issues when it comes to our market operators. And I really, really want our market operators um, to take the conduct of business guidelines very seriously, um, you know, study it and uh, be, become properly aligned. You might notice that there may be parts that you may be already practicing there may be parts that you may not be practicing, but the point is we are working towards excellence, excellence in our industry. And we think and we believe that these are some of the things that will help us um, attain that level of excellence. When it comes to general requirements for the conduct of business, uh, again, this is not new. For those of you who are familiar with the compliance manual, uh, which the uh, commission released uh, many, many years ago, uh, you find a number of these things there, but we, you know, they are all captured here again, just to, if you like, bring it uh, you know, to uh, the fore. Uh, every market operator is expected to act with integrity and fairness, uh, to apply due care, uh, skill, and diligence, and in the best interest of its clients and the integrity, uh, of the market, uh, we expect high standards of ethical and professional uh, conduct, ethical and professional conduct, ethical and professional uh, conduct. I'm repeating myself for the sake of emphasis. Um, we also expect that at all times, the, there will be strict compliance. One of the things that we actually are looking for it is where we have our market operators are very compliant with the various regulations, directives, guidelines, circulars, and other regulatory requirements that uh, the act imposes. 
and 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 so um, that is um, if you like a, a minimum requirement and it's always good for uh, market to process to even exceed the minimum um, requirement when it comes to relations with the commission um, we are highlighting three things here on the uh, slide that uh, we expect cooperation with the uh, commission um, at all times, um, cooperation with every reasonable um, assistance that we require. Uh, for instance, I, I am told that sometimes when it comes to submission of data, um, you know, it's a problem uh, because there are delays and uh, that is not good enough. Uh, at all times, we are saying in this conduct of business guideline that we expect cooperation uh, from the market operators. Um, of course, the second item has to do with uh, something everybody uh, is um, very particular about, and that's uh, when it comes to money matters. Um, we are saying that, you know, we expect prompt payment in such form uh, or manner that we shall prescribe any fees that, um, you know, are due, are, are due the commission. Uh, I'm sure you agree that it's not a good idea to be owing your regulator. Uh, that certainly um, is, is, is not good. And then um, we also expect, especially once we are aware that there are uh, groups or holding companies or, or financial conglomerates, as uh, some will call it, um, we have some requirements for uh, reports and we expect cooperation uh, in that space as well. Then the next thing has to do with the board of directors. One of the things that came up uh, in our exercise of bringing the cleanup of the asset management industry uh, was that, you know, a number of the firms, the board composition was uh, less than desirable. Uh, then, you know, the boards were not as active or effective as was uh, expected. Indeed, you know, we had instances where we had organized some hearings uh, because of some complaints lodged by clients about their inability to access their funds on maturity. And you'd find that some directors uh, indicated that they were not aware, they were not involved. Uh, so clearly you, you get a sense that in some of the instances, the directors <clears throat> excuse me, the directors were detached, not involved, not engaged. So the, the board um, issue is very important here. And what we are saying is that each market operator uh, should have a board that provides strategic guidance uh, to lead and control the um, operations of the market operator to ensure that they are uh, taking uh, their fiduciary responsibility uh, seriously. Uh, they are operating in a prudent manner, ethical, uh, effective. Uh, they are discharging their responsibilities to their investors uh, and various uh, stakeholders and observing uh, you know, all the requirements imposed uh, by the uh, act or any other, um, you know, self-regulatory organization that the market operator would be uh, a member uh, of, of. Now, one of the things that uh, is new in this conduct of business uh, here is that uh, when it comes to appointing to the board, the market operator is required to write to the commission uh, notifying the commission of its intention to make an appointment to the board and shall not, shall not, shall not make the appointment unless and until the commission has given approval. Uh, previously, we were not um, approving uh, directors for our market operators, but 
uh, once we have issued the conduct of business guidelines, what it means is that you cannot have a director appointed without the approval of the commission. It's important to take note of this um, new thing. This slide just um, you know, brings up something which I believe uh, market operators are aware of, the fact that in looking at the composition of the board, uh, the integrity, experience, qualifications, um, you know, skills uh, matter. You know, I think those are, are key. What I'll just highlight here is that we say in this conduct of business guidelines that there must be a good balance between executive and non-executive directors. Now, we don't only talk about non-executive directors, we are stressing on independent non-executive uh, director. So, so that is important. So there must be a good balance between the executive directors and then the non-executive directors. And take note that we are not just talking about non-executive directors, but independent non-executive uh, directors. Uh, we also say in the guidelines that the chairman of the board shall not be the CEO unless or except the commission has given uh, the permission for that to happen. And uh, when we uh, give the, that permission, um, we, we would specify certain measures that must be in place uh, to ensure that um, you know, things are done in a way uh, that will not undermine uh, the observance of corporate governance. So that is also a point to note that uh, the chairman of the board and the CEO cannot be the same person except uh, the uh, commission has get granted permission for that uh, to uh, happen. In terms of the, um, the roles and uh, responsibilities of uh, the directors, we, we give a number of uh, details in terms of uh, you know, when it comes to the operations of the market operator, uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, ma management information. Uh, I will just pick on two other things on this slide. That's risk management and then internal controls. Again, it is evident to us from uh, the exercise that we have uh, conducted over the past uh, year or so that uh, risk management um, is not being well done in uh, our market operators. And we like the boards to take note that uh, risk management is one of the functions that we as a commission, we expect them to, uh, to, to give the oversight uh, to uh, management to ensure that uh, right uh, measures for risk management are employed where the market operators are concerned. And then also the need for uh, internal controls, putting in place uh, internal controls and then uh, the function of the compliance officer. So, so the, the, the board must be interested in all these things that would ensure that uh, you know, corporate governance uh, practice in our market operators um, is is um, you know uh, adhered to now. Uh, this slide just talks about some of the other duties that uh, we specify in the act when it comes to uh, employees. Then uh, this this slide deals with uh, you know relations with uh, clients, relations <coughs> excuse me, relations with uh, 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 clients. Um, how we expect the market um, operator to deal with clients. And, and this is very important because um, really um, we exist because of the clients that we uh, seek to serve. You know, so for the market operator, uh, the relations with clients is very, uh, very uh, important. So um, there are a number of things that we have uh, detailed in the guidelines when it comes to um, relations with 
clients and um, we we expect the market operators you know to go by them uh, i'll just m mention one general thing that um, it, you know it's it's worthy of note um, uh, we, we we expect that you know market operators will, 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 will deal truly with the client um, will be professional in their dealings with uh, the client and would give adequate disclosure uh, to their clients. And um, we also highlight here the fact that when it comes to how you make money on your clients or from your clients, um, it should be according to what agreement has been entered into with uh, the client. Very important. There are a few more uh, details that you find in the uh, guidelines, but I'm just highlighting the fact that um, when it comes to relating with clients, we are expecting the highest uh, professional uh, standards and uh, giving adequate disclosure at all times to the um, the, the client. You find that on this slide, you know, it's the, the, the reference uh, is, is, is a lot to, um, you know, dealing with clients when it comes to investment uh, decisions. And um, you might find that we seem to be, um, you know, emphasizing that uh, not that the other licensees uh, are not important, but I think it's clear that when it comes to the asset management industry, uh, when things don't go well, it can affect the entire uh, securities uh, industry. So, um, you know, we are expecting that the market traders will take note of these uh, duties when it comes to relating with the clients. Um, you know, there's also this issue of how we expect the market operators to deal with uh, complaints. Uh, every every um, operator is expected to have uh, a system, a complaint resolution system uh, that uh, makes sure that clients or uh, you know the customers are always sorted out. You know when uh, they they have issues. You know the, the procedure is clear. And, and so it's, it's, it's up to uh, market operators to uh, make sure that they observe it. You know, my, my understanding is that, um, you know, not all the market operators have established effective, um, you know, complaint resolution systems. And um, maybe let me jump the gun and say that you know, when it comes to inspections, uh, we, you know, we have routine inspections or regular uh, inspections. Uh, we can have uh, what we call for course inspections, but we can also have thematic inspections. And I can give you this alert that uh, one of the things going forward we'll be doing will be thematic inspections. So for instance, we, will take, uh, we can take the guidelines that we have issued and then we'll come and check whether the things that we have specified in the guidelines, how compliant you are. And, and uh, so for instance, talking about complaints, um, we can actually just come, just look at the complaint system, uh, not a regular routine uh, inspection. So uh, the point is, let's you know, take notes of this and uh, make sure that uh, we do um, the right thing when it comes to uh, resolving complaints from the clients. Then there's a provision on client money, um, how client money is handled. Now, there also uh, is one thing that came up during the exercise that we conducted. That is where there were market operators who were commingling operational funds with client funds. And actually that is criminal uh, if, if you look at the act. Uh, we, we, have, we had situations where some market operators were using client money to fund operational activities. That's clearly criminal 
uh, activity. Well, we have provisions in the conduct of business guidelines that deals with how um, client money must uh, be handled. Uh, we recently issued a directive on uh, the creation of trust accounts. Um, and we are expecting, again, compliance. I'm not going to go through all of them one by one, but I'm just saying that, uh, you know, we, we, this is something that uh, is very important when it comes to how we handle uh, uh, client money and the fact that it's actually um, a criminal activity, it's an offense. And, um, you know, you, you can end up in, in, in prison if uh, it, is, it is established. And, um, you know, for the firms whose licenses uh, uh, were revoked um, recently, um, I can again say that where it's established that some of them were doing this using client money, uh, they might have to, um, you know, answer you know, uh, at appropriate uh, forum, you know, for that uh, misdemeanor. We, we also have, um, you know, some provisions on, you know, when it comes to doing reconciliation uh, with client money. Like I'm saying, I'm not going to really go into all the details. I'm just highlighting um, these various elements uh, in the guidelines. Then we have the client assets and how we expect the uh, market operator to um, handle um, you know, client assets in a manner that is separated and clearly distinguishable from those of the intermediary. Um, we have a number of copious uh, provisions on that. And we, we, we have uh, considered, um, you know, the fact that um, it, it may be more prudent to move the market to the situation where uh, they make use of um, the services of custodians um, just to ensure uh, th this separation uh, between assets of the client and then assets of um, the market operator. I'm sure the custodians will be happy to uh, hear that. Um, we also have provisions on executing, um, you know, client um, orders. Remember one of the points we made earlier, to be fair, um, you know, and it's, we, we, we have provisions, um, especially when it comes to um, trading, no front running and so on and so forth. And then there's the issue of conflict of interest. And we uh, also have in place a provision where we are requiring the, the market operators to design policies that will mitigate uh, conflict of interest situation. This is when it comes to dealing um, you know, with uh, clients. Um, you know, so we, we, we have, for instance, we say the market operator shall ensure that any fee uh, charged, uh, commission, gift, hospitality, or any payment received from a third party will not encourage the market intermediate or its staff to act in a way other than in the best interest uh, of the uh, client. Um, market operator is not to take advantage of information, uh, you know, to uh, benefit um, you know, another client because of some uh, unknown relationships, et cetera, et cetera. But the point is there must be uh, a framework in place to deal with uh, the issue of conflict of interest. Uh, there's also the issue when it comes to uh, re re uh, when you are part of a group, you know, what are some of the things that um, you need to do, especially to ensure that conflict of interest is um, minimized. So I think I have just done, um, you know, a quick highlights, if you like, of, you know, some provisions in the licensing guidelines and then the conduct of uh, business guidelines. My expectation is that 
we would have all market appraisers to take time to really delve into these guidelines and um, work their way towards compliance. And um, you know, we have always said that if uh, there's any doubts as to um, you know, what you make of the guidelines, you can always come to the commission and then we will give uh, the um, explanation or the interpretation. So I think I will uh, pause here and I guess the moderator may now uh, bring some of the questions that uh, you have uh, for us to uh, look at how we can respond uh, to them. So thank you for your attention and um, let's uh, have some engagement with you at this time. All right, thank you very much for your patience and for the comments and the questions that you have been sending in. Once again, the email is communications at sec.gov.gh. So before we get into the questions or the question segment, we will allow the executive secretary of the GSIA to share a few comments on what she's heard so far and what the reflections are as far as the partnership is concerned and the way forward. So I'd like to invite Ms. Marianjani to express these words to us. Thank you. Thank you, Godwin. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we okay. Can. Yeah, thank you, Godwin and um, Reverend and the team for organizing this forum. The GSI is always willing to engage with our, the commission values its partnership with the GSI and is keen on having frequent engagements with members to promote the integrity of the market and to boost market development. It's also great to hear that the SEC is mindful of the fact that although these guidelines give direction on the way business should be conducted, to an extent it can stifle innovation and it's therefore um, making room for that. So we are really, we are always happy to hear uh, of an opportunity to engage with the, regulation, with the regulator on such. And um, I would also like to thank the DG and his team for the opportunity to review the guidelines um, in times past. So the GSI standing committees have also made contributions and to make constructive criticisms. Thank you, Reverend, and thank you everybody once again. All right, thank you very much, Marianne, for your thoughts on what is happening currently. As we <laughs> mentioned earlier, we very much value the partnership we have with the GSIA. So I'll start with my, uh, the first question, which we have received from uh, Frimpon Beverly from the Standard Chartered Bank, Ghana. So this is a question, and this is somebody who has obviously engaged with uh, the guidelines. So she makes references to some of these guidelines. So the first question is, um, so DSEC, thank you for arranging the stakeholder engagement and giving us opportunity to seek clarity concerning the guidelines issued to the market. So she has two fold questions. So the first question is, in relation to capital requirement for licenses, she's asked, in a scenario where a bank holds the PD license, and meets the 400 million capital requirement by the central bank. And this same bank holds about two or more licenses from SEC for other services. Will the bank be required to cover 75% of the other licenses in addition to the 400 million capital requirement met? That's the first question. We are gonna unpack this in uh, different sections. Now, the second question is, is SEC willing to cap the capital <laughs> requirement at 400 million for PDs? So I think we'd like to start with the, with the first question. She makes reference to paragraphs two, three, four, and five of the capital requirements in respect of regulated activities. So the first question again, I don't know who would like to take the first sure, question. I, I'll take it. And I'll say that the answer to the second question would uh, cover 
the uh, first question. Uh, so yes, Beverly, um, in the case of banks holding a PD license, SEC is willing to cap the minimum capital requirements at 400 million. And so like I'm saying that, that uh, will cover your first question uh, as well. Okay, all right. Thank you very much. And then the second question is from Kofi Sapon, and he represents Sapon Capital. So I see two questions here. So is there a separate definition for qualified investor, or are we, are we to rely on the definition um, in the private funds guidelines? That's the first question. I don't know if you want to speak to that first. Okay, so um, I'll let Paul uh, speak to the question on um, uh, the qualified investor and then the components of the okay. capital. Paul right. can take that. Okay. Yeah, maybe uh, Deborah can take uh, Clarkson's uh, question on um, who can be said to be an independent um, director. Okay. For the qualified investor, uh, we have it in, our, in the private funds guideline. Um, and so members can reference that. But what we will do is to look at issuing a circular that simply puts it out there as a, as a separate Deborah, I will take your answer to the second question. Yes. Um, okay. okay. Maybe Deborah can take it. I think uh, his, his, his mic is Okay, is okay. Some, uh, All right. So we'll, we'll come back page. to it. Yes, we'll come back to that. <laughs> okay. So Deborah, um, on the independent investor, is that a... Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Uh, okay, very good. So there's a question... Independent director or... Ex independent director, not investor. Okay, very good. Good. So, do you want to speak to that? So, an independent director is a director who does not have any material relationship with the company. So, it would be somebody who is not linked to the company in any way. It's not a shareholder. It's not an executive director. But just comes in to sit for fee. So, the person is not linked to the company in any way apart from being there as a director. That's I'm sorry. We can't hear you. <laughs> you didn't hear anything. Okay. Yeah, try again. Okay. So um, I think maybe we can also type the answer. Yes, we will do that. Yeah, okay. Okay. So an independent director is an outside director. So you are not an executive director. You are not linked to the company in, form, in the form of a shareholding agreement in any shape or form. So you come there to just be an independent director without any other link to the company. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Hello, but if I may ask, does it mean that I thought in certain, certain jurisdiction, it, uh, uh, the quantum of shareholding could also be used as a basis to determine who an independent director is? I.e., for instance, if he has about 5% or less, he could be seen as an independent director. Is it applicable in this instance? Well, for us, we just want somebody who is not linked to the company in any shape or form. So, zero shareholding? Yes. I see. Okay. Thank you. All right. All right. So, we'll continue with the Q&A section. So, what we have here probably would be a few, um, probably to center a bit on part of the presentation that you, you conducted, uh, Rev. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned the plan of action in relation to the uh, compliance with the MCR. Some of the, uh, the viewers and the listeners want to understand 
how soon these plans should be submitted and what these plans should entail, if you could reiterate that furthermore. Okay, so um, basically what we'll be looking to get from the operators okay. is that um, to be able to meet the MCR, this is how they are going to raise it. Maybe they are going to go to the existing shareholders or they will look for new shareholders to come in, um, et cetera, et cetera. So the whole point is will, will be what will be the strategy okay. that they'll use to raise the uh, additional capital okay. and what timeline would uh, they have? So for instance, um, they may say that after three months or after six months, okay. uh, we may have signed it's an agreement or an MOU or whatever uh, with this entity. Uh, in nine months, we expect maybe the first tranche. Uh, you know, so it's, it's basically a game plan, you know, on how they are going to raise the money that um, would enable them to become compliant. Okay. Um, like I said, we, uh, we have started working on identifying those that um, fall short based on the records that we have. Okay. And uh, we'll be writing to them to let them know that uh, they fall short and they need to take the steps. Okay. But I'm saying to them that you don't need to wait for uh, the commission to write to you. Okay. You know, the deadline has been set. So get to work immediately. Okay. And, uh, we, we, you know, so that when we ask you for the plan, mm -hmm. you, you'll be ready to even submit it. Okay. Okay. But at the end of the day, it's a plan or a game plan uh, with timeline that you are going to submit to help you uh, to be compliant. So really, that's what uh, we'll be looking out for. But don't wait to uh, receive a letter from the commission first. You know your current situation. Okay. You know the desired level. Work out how you, you are going to close that gap. Okay. That if you want to continue. All right. And for instance, if you are going to uh, explore the uh, option of, let's say, a business combination, like a merger uh, of sorts, uh, or you you're going to approach a big player to take you over, okay. you know, those are steps that you should initiate. Okay. And then uh, you give us a plan that, okay, we'll start merger talks, uh, we'll conclude by this time. So it's all about how you are going to be able to close the gap uh, between where you are and then um, where the levels have been uh, set. Okay. Yes. Uh, th there was a question from one Charles Amakwata okay. uh, where he says, uh, why does an individual investor, investment advisor, why does an individual investment advisor uh, need a minimum uh, capital. My, my simple answer is this. When it comes to the securities industry, it is regulated activity. And when it comes to regulated activity, there are certain things that um, are required for you to be able to meet, okay. for you to um, be fit. <laughs> And proper, you know. So um, it is one of uh, the requirements, you know. But the, you know, the point is, you 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 also want to make sure that uh, whoever is going to operate within the space um, is is um, is financially um, sound. Okay. You know, it, it just an, an an indicator of a, a total. Uh, package, okay. you know, not uh, just integrity, but a, a total package. Okay. Uh, so it, it's, it's part of the requirements that um, will qualify you to get a license. And when it comes to regulated activity, it is always like that. You need to have uh, some requirements. Um, otherwise, then any and everybody can, can come in. But okay. there, there has to be a means by which uh, there's a restriction of who can come in 
and who can operate in the uh, industry. So you mentioned in your presentation that for, for new entrants, they are expected to be compliant immediately. And then for uh, existing players, we give them up to, or you give them up to the end of uh, next year, 2021. So the question is, is this going to be a hard enforceable timeline or would there be opportunities to extend this if necessary? Thank you, Godwin. You know, I have said before that um, as a regulator, we are reasonable. Okay. We are reasonable. Um, if there is a reasonable basis to reconsider the deadline, why not? We would mm -hmm. reconsider it. Okay. Uh -huh. But as we sit here, um, no one has put before me a reasonable basis, okay. um, you know, to reconsider uh, this this uh, deadline. And you know, we actually started this engagement um, 2018. Okay. Uh, even before then, but 2018 was when we <clears throat> we put out the numbers. So, you know, people would have had a view of where. The, the levels would be. Okay. And my expectation would be that um, if it's a coming soon, it's coming. Well, it, it hasn't come yet. We don't know when it's going to come. But at least the fact that there's a signal that it's coming soon, you should you know, take some uh, steps to be able to uh, prepare for that. You okay. know? So I don't think anyone can say there's a total surprise. Okay. You know? And then we are saying that we have uh, 12 months plus um, almost uh, three months okay. uh, of this year. That's about 15 months. Okay. Um, you know, so it, 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 sh it should work. But what I'm saying is that we are not unreasonable. Okay. But so far, I don't have uh, a case in front of me which okay. says that, no, um, do not... Um, you know, stick with this deadline. So okay. as we sit and as we speak, the deadline is 31st December uh, 2021. And okay. it's important for the firms concerned to put their plans together and then um, uh, engage so that if um, some consideration can be given, okay. then we can look at that. But the deadline remains 31st December 2021. Okay. All right. Thank you for the clarity on that. We have a few questions uh, from uh, members. And I have one question from Kofi Kodua Sapon. So his organization is Sapon Capital. And this is what he says. He has a premise. He says, in the U.S. government bond market, which is $14.4 trillion, banks require only $150 million to be primary dealers. Dealers need only $50 million. That's the premise. He also says the Ghanaian government bond market, which is about 120 billion Ghana cities. So he gives a value for that. And we are asking for 67 million equivalent to participate. So I think that his question is whether this is really a reasonable ask in the context in which we find ourselves, comparing ourselves to, to the US situation. So I think he's referring to the minimum capital requirement for primary yes, dealers. Yes. And um, you know, at the time we issued the draft for the market to comment on, um, the one there was no um, pushback, um, you know, about that. Mm -hmm. But we also know that in Ghana, um, typically is the um, is the banks that um, you know. Um, uh, position themselves, you know, for the primary uh, dealer uh, okay. license. And, and, and the banks already are required to meet the minimum capital required by their primary regulator. Okay. Okay. So if the, um, their primary regulator requires um, that level, it, it's, it's reasonable to uh, require that. Um, so uh, that, that would be my, uh, my response. Um, I know back in the day, there were some other operators that 
um, you know, we're looking to operate in that space. Right? Okay. As far as I'm concerned now, it's principally the banks that um, get to uh, operate as primary dealers. Okay. And um, their primary regulator requires 400 million. And we uh, make reference to what their primary regulator okay. uh, requires. All right. Um, what I can also, you know, quickly say is that, you know, the beauty about these guidelines that we have issued, um, unlike maybe an airline, okay. is that um, where some adjustment needs to be made, okay. um, it can easily be made at um, the level of commission okay. without having to go through a certain process. Okay. So if, um, you know, uh, further down the line, there, there is a reason to take another look at some provision or the other, we can take a look at it and then um, do what we need to do. Okay. So that, that would be my, my, uh, my response um, to Kodia Sapon's uh, okay. question. There's a second question here by Kofi Bray. He says, fund managers currently pay 5,000 Ghana cities. What is the basis for this fee? And he continues by saying that if this was 5% of the 100,000, then are we to expect 20,000 cities as a new annual licensing fees? Or is the SEC going to review the percentage applied? I could repeat the question if you would want me no, to. No, no, I'm okay. fine. Um, <laughs> The five thousand is is the is the market levy. Yes. Uh, so Bray has got it wrong. The five thousand is the market levy. Okay. And you know the the act empowers us and gives us the power to uh, levy the operators a certain amount to fa help fund. Okay. Um, the the work of the, um, the industry. The licensing fee itself is it a thousand? Yes. Yes, a thousand. Um, um, okay. And then 500 for renewal. Okay, so uh, that's that. But I think his question is, um, you know, what would sensing fee be like? Okay, my response is, don't worry, wait for us to issue. We are not going to be departing from the structure of doing uh, of mom capital. Okay. Uh, maybe I, I can even, um, you know, go as far to say, and uh, I'm sure Paul will confirm that, that okay. in the levels that we set, the, if you work the percentage, it's lower than okay. if you look at the percentage currently, if, mm -hmm. if you look at the airline, okay. the percentage between the licensing fees and the minimum capital, okay. uh, if you work it and compare with what we'll be issuing, you'll find that we dropped the... Um, the the percentage okay okay you know but just wait to uh, um, so we issue the um, the notice on the licensing fees and you realize that um, it is not unreasonable okay uh, but still maintaining that it's a percentage of the uh, the minimum capital but you know I can confirm that we did reduce. The percentage. The percentage, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. And there's a question from Winifred Amachi, and his organization is uh, Injaro, Injaro Limited. He says, would there be a guideline on liquidity reserves for the various market operators? The answer is yes. <clears throat> we have um, what we call financial resources guidelines, and it was part of the guidelines that we shared with the market okay. uh, back in the day, and we got some feedback. We are in the process of finalizing uh, those guidelines because that will specify, you know, all the liquidity uh, re requirements. Okay. So uh, it's 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 close to uh, being finalized, and uh, I'm confident that before the end of the year, Paul, before the end of the year, we'll be able to issue it. So okay. yes, there will be. Um, guidelines on that. Okay, thank you very much. It's, it's called financial resources. Financial resources. Guidelines, okay. Yes. Not. Okay. Yeah. So the graph is even on our website. Okay. Because we did share it back in the day. Okay. All right. Thank you. So we have an interesting question here, <laughs> that um, 
would be interesting to address. So he says that he wants to be clear. He says that even if you have a plan in place, because you've spoken quite extensively about having a plan to show up your capital for to meet the new uh, requirements. He says, will your license be withdrawn if you are an existing operator, even when you present this plan and are unable to meet uh, the deadline of 31st December 2021? The answer is very simple. They are, we call them licensing requirements. Okay. <clears throat> so if you cannot meet the requirements for holding the license, then it means that you, you will no longer uh, be able to operate with the license. Okay. As to what it means, um, you know, there, there, there will be a number of options. Okay. And, you know, as it is said, uh, we'll cross the bridge when we get there. Okay. <laughs> but, I mean, the, the bottom line is that you don't, you're unable to meet the licensing requirements, so you cannot be licensed, so you cannot operate okay. um, in the industry. What happens to the, the, okay. the uh, clients you are managing, blah, blah, blah. Okay. And, and that's why I'm saying that we are going to insist on having um, the operator submit a plan. Okay. So we'll be tracking it. Okay. So it won't be like it, it will hit us, you know, by surprise at the end of the period that FEM A, FEM B, FEM C um, is not able to meet it. Okay. Before we get there, we'll have an idea and we'll have a plan in place as to what uh, you know, contingency or interim measures uh, to adopt where it comes to the, um, you know, market operator uh, concern. Okay. There will be different scenarios, but the point is, if you don't meet the licensing requirements, then you cannot operate uh, okay. in the industry. Mr. Jimfra, do you want to add to that? I just wanted to clarify the independent director that for more information in the guidelines here, there's more information on who an independent director is. And on the question on whether we have minority shares, well, the FAB would approve all directors. So okay. So we get substantial um, or majority shareholders, the person should be in your group. Okay. Yet with the approval process, we can look at those things. So okay. Finally, it's not, um, we, we don't prohibit. Okay. Then the percentages will be picked up. Okay. So I just want to so it's no longer zero percent as we said initially. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, all right, thank you. So we have a question from Nana AJ Opoku Ajiman. So he's from a Black Star brokerage. He says, under the current market structure, particularly the GSE, GFIM, the underlisted roles are performed by LDMs. Does that mean going forward, you would need to have the combined required capital in order to undertake the underlisted rules? So that is his question. So the question, the rules are broker, de dealer, margin trader, market maker, issuing house, and underwriter. Okay, so I think my, my, my response, I'll make reference to what uh, the question that Beverly asked. I mean, the first question that uh, we addressed. And you find that um, you know, she pulled a, a, a portion uh, from the guidelines okay. um, where uh, it, it talked about the fact that where a market operator is licensed for two or more regulated activities, okay. then it specifies what can be done. So the, the answer is right there. Okay. Um, you know, it is, it is right there. Okay, thank you. So there's another question from I think he's engaged a number of times. So he speaks about the issue of possibly uh, double counting as far as the capital requirements are concerned. So um, I think given, he said, given broker dealers, at least dealing side and market makers and underwriters do the same thing, wouldn't we be double counting the capital requirements? Okay, maybe uh, let, let okay. me let uh, Paul speak on this. I think an element of this guideline is also introducing certain market activities um, that are not regulated before. Okay. Um, and it allowed firms to take on different levels of risk and to, to enhance their intermediation. Um, to do some of these activities, you need to have a stronger balance sheet. 
Okay. And I found that it must be from a good supposition. Uh, and so the attempt here is to differentiate that as you enhance your risk level, as you get additional business uh, that deepens your business, you also need to have the necessary resources to support that business. Okay. Uh, and so in terms of the double counting, I think as my director general mentioned, there's a small discount. So mm -hmm. you have additional capital, right? Not the full level of capital. It reduced to 75%. Um, on the financial resources side, we'll address the level of liquidity that you require to have to support that, uh, which would be also a portion. It wouldn't be the full level of capital that you would be required to have as liquid assets. You may require to have a portion of that. And I think a, a key element of, of this increased level is that as, a, as an operator, we have a market where the operators don't even have their own resources to play in the market. And so the idea is to have ensure that the operators have resources, also are familiar with the product that they trade, and contribute to the growth of the market through some of these investments that we are trying to make. Okay. Thank you. All right. So as much as possible, we would like you to keep your questions as, uh, all right. I think there was a, a question on the qualified investor. Okay. And the, the definition is also in the conduct of business guidelines uh, on page 38 uh, of, 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 the, of the interpretations. So members can, can look at that. Um, the commission has indicated that from time to time we will issue the, the liquid assets for individuals. That would make them qualified investors. Okay. Uh, and so that definition is in the, in, in the conduct of business as well. As okay. All right. In other words, you'd like them to engage further with the guidelines exactly. for those who have it. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. And it's available on our website. All right. Good. So there's a question from George Doe. He says, please, regarding the non-objection requirement for board member appointment, will this be necessary if the requirements are objective and transparent? Objective and transparent. Who would like to take that? My answer is yes. And that's a simple answer. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. So James also has uh, a question. James, make sure that next time you send a submission, you add it, uh, your full name and the organization you present. So it's on the issue of client assets, I did not see any guide on provisions that market operators should make for client assets that are impaired or that goes bad. Okay. Anyone wants to speak to that? Paul? Um, I, I think we our reporting requirements are the IFRS, okay. the International Financial Reporting Standards. Mm -hmm. And so there's no need to bring that in. And that's the point you're making about enhanced inspections. That the fund managers or whoever is holding client assets um, should also be accounted to the clients on the value of the assets um, as the markets also evolve. Okay. So if you are reporting the proper position, we should be making provisions, we should be informing the client on any impairments um, so that clients are also advised properly. Um, and then also we look at how people report on performance. Mm -hmm. But if it's performance that is not real, that is uh, fictional, uh, that can also be an issue and that affects the market reputation. Okay. And that's where the integrity of the market is, is also crucial. Okay. Thank you very much. Any comments on that? No, no, no. I, th I, think, I think that's it. Um, I, I am aware that, um, especially when it comes to, um, let's say, um, what has happened okay. with um, some farm managers where their uh, money is locked up due to counterparty uh, defaults, mm -hmm. you know, what you know, do you do in terms of uh, impairing um, you know, the assets? I'm aware that there are some collective investment schemes, for instance, that um, you know they, they they've made some investments, uh, they've done bad, and they've um, impaired those uh, investments. So probably um, the the James is um, asking if the um, if the commission is going to prescribe, you know, or, or issue a directive that. Right when you know similar to what uh, bog has that okay. um if after 
a certain period and asset is not performing, mm -hmm. you know, what steps you need to take? Uh, probably that's where James is headed with this question. Um, in this particular guideline, um, you know, the, the conduct of business guideline, the focus was on how the operators should relate to cl client assets. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so it is something that we can take a look at, um, okay. you know, whether we would want to give, um, you know, that guidance, which says that uh, do A, B, C, D. Um, it, it, you know, so that is, is something that we can, we can take, um, you know, uh, at a later stage in okay. terms of giving a clear direction to the industry, similar to uh, what uh, Bank of, um, of Ghana um, has given to the bank. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah. So there's a question from Jerry. His question is, what is the expected legal form of an investment advisor? And he specifies individual. Would it be a natural person or a sole proprietorship? I think, um, okay, maybe Deborah wants to okay. uh, uh, answer that. But we, we provided two options, um, a corporate or an individual. Yes. You know, and if it's an individual, that's a natural person. Yes. So those two options uh, are provided. I don't know whether, uh, Deborah, you want to? Okay. Okay. All right. And then we have another question from Ni Ampasoa. It says, collective investment schemes pay licensing fees but are not required to be capitalized in the traditional sense. How would these fees, or as he mentions, be determined? Yes, it's, it's, I think um, we have had uh, a regime um, for how the collective investment schemes um, you know, are charged okay. their licensing fees. So we will just ride on that, um, on, on, the, on the rationale for that, um, regime we have in place, you know, to determine the, um, the levels for the collective investment okay. schemes. Um, again, like I said, um, we, 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 we had developed an elaborate structure, which we took out of the licensing guidelines okay. uh, because of the freeze on upward revision of fees and charges. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the right time, when, um, when we have the clearance to be able to issue, we would uh, issue. And uh, again, I can confirm that um, we are looking at nothing that would burden mm -hmm. um, you know, the market operators or, or the schemes. Okay, thank you very much. And then there's a second or follow-up question on that. So he says for, for directives, and that has to do with uh, no objection regarding the appointment of directors. So he says, for directives that require the approval of the SEC, example, the appointment of directors, is there an indication of how soon we will hear from the SEC when we put through a request? And, or is there an assumed number of days that should elapse such that if we do not hear from the SEC, we can assume that the appointment has no objection? Okay, so my response is that um, w when it comes to the approval of uh, directors, we, okay. we, we don't have uh, the provision which says that if you do not hear from us by a certain time, then you assume <laughs> that um, there is no uh, objection. Yes. We, don't, we don't have that. Okay. Uh, simply because we want to take interest in who becomes uh, a director. Mm -hmm. And I, I think the, the questioner is trying to get us to commit to a certain time frame okay. within which to make the decision uh, so that market operators can look forward to uh, some, if you like, a better predictability mm -hmm. as to when they would, um, they would, they would, um, they would hear, um, they would hear from us. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm aware that uh, when uh, for instance, you know, the tax people, uh, Ghana Revenue Authority, when they um, issue their, um, I mean, their laws, okay. uh, they also have what they call practice notes. Okay. So the practice yeah. notes. Practice notes. Uh -huh, okay. they, 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 they come up with the practice notes, which would provide some more detail okay. in terms of uh, how, you know, things will be worked out. And, and so we will address 
uh, these concerns. But I can give the commitment that um, the SEC will not inordinately delay any um, approval uh, process. Okay. Um, sometimes when it comes to approving uh, some of the applications that we have, and for instance, we engage BNI okay. to, to run some uh, checks for us. Um, sometimes you can't, you know, uh, put a cap on how long B and I will okay. turn around mm -hmm. and and get back to us. So okay. depending on the number of, you know, processes or things we need to do, uh, it could impact on the timing. But okay. um, again, I want to give the assurance that we'll be sensitive uh, not to uh, delay the process. Okay. Uh, because our commitment is to support the market to uh, develop. Uh, so let's see how we would, um, you know, work out in our, our version of the practice notes okay. on, you know, the turnaround time. But, okay. you know, for, for now, we cannot have a situation that if you don't hear by a certain time, then uh, you take it that the no objection is granted. Okay. All right. Thank you. So there's a question from um, Evans uh, Dakwa from UMB Investment Holdings. So his question is, Please, can a fund manager apply for a market maker license? That's the first one. And in the same question, they ask, do they need separate capital for such multiple licenses? Um, I think what, okay, so two things. One, what, one is that um, if you um, are carrying on an activity, um, in more than one, you know, regulated, um, uh, one, uh, more than one license area, okay. uh, we gave the direction about the, the minimum, uh, minimum capital. Um, but for instance, we are clear that if you have um, uh, a fund management license, you okay. can't use the same entity, the same company, to uh, apply for a broker okay. dealer, uh, you can be part of the group. You can have, you can create another, um, another um, okay. subsidiary All right. that would then apply for the, um, you know, the broker uh, dealer, um, you know, license. So, so, so those those uh, distinctions are already there. That based on the um, the activity, okay. um, you cannot. But for instance, um, um, with the issuing house, um, issuing house license, okay. you can have a, a, a broker mm -hmm. a dealer. Because I think we have a, a, a couple who are holding both, okay. uh, you know, the broker uh, dealer license, and then they've also got an issuing license. So it depends on the business activity okay yeah, i think that distinction has to be there okay for some you can't use the same entity uh for others you can use the same entity uh where you can use the same entity i mean what we have said about the capital uh requirement that mm -hmm. for the second activity to be a percentage i think we mentioned 75 percent okay. uh in the in, in the uh in the guidelines but where you need a separate uh entity or subsidiary, that is also clear. It means that it's a different entity. So you have to meet the uh, minimum capital required for that activity. Okay. So okay. I think people must just be clear about the distinction. Okay. And this is clear in the guidelines provided. It is. Okay. All right. And I think the, the market makers and the market creators are actually for broker dealers. Okay. Not for fund managers. Okay. So that's... Okay. Okay, not fund managers. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Looks like all too soon we have exhausted the time we, we scheduled for this engagement. So what we encourage is uh, to continue sending your questions to communications at sec.gov.gh. We'll respond um, to you by email. Make sure that your, your contact details are there so we can circle back to you. And as we indicated, there will be a number of engagements after this. But before we, we, we sign off, I would like to take uh, final remarks from each of you. So I'll start with you, Paul, and I'm going to go this way. So anything you want to add to what has been said so far? Well, I think um, obviously I want to extend our appreciation to GSI. Okay. Um, for the engagement. Um, I think 
we we have appreciated the support we received in terms of the reports that we can produce, and we look forward to deepening the market, seeing um, greater capacity, really among among stakeholders, okay. um, and to see the level of uh, serious professionalism that uh, we expect Ghana's capital markets to expect, um, so that we also can grow the wealth of the country and the wealth of our investors. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Jumfa. Okay. And then we can work through those things. And okay. That in a year, we will all be at the level, all our assets will be at the level of conduct of business that we want. Okay. And then by the end of 2021, the licensing issues will also have to be. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, General. Well, thank you, Godwin, um, for working with GSI to have this happen. Uh, once again, thank you to GSI, the Governing Council, and the members for making uh, this happen. And um, i like to apologize. I, I, I still get a sense that, you know, the sound hasn't been as good as it can be, uh, but, you know, do accept our apologies um, that, you know, it wasn't, if you like, uh, the best in terms of the optimum in terms of the, the sound uh, production. But I think all in all, it's been a useful uh, time of engagement uh, remember that we have talked about education, enforcement, and then market development. When it comes to issues of enforcement, you might see the commission uh, as a head teacher or a policeman. Okay. But you know, it's not only about enforcement. Uh, it's about education. It's about market development. And we believe that um, you know uh, the market operators must see the regulator, uh, you know, as a partner. I, I, I keep harping on this uh, issue of partnership because I believe that uh, we need that partnership to deepen the securities industry um, in Ghana. And I always say that uh, the commission is not unreasonable. Uh, we'll always be willing to work with the uh, market, but we have a mandate. And our mandate is to protect investors and to protect the integrity of the securities industry and to that we will remain true okay thank you very much for your final comments uh, we'll be also sending out uh, some announcements in terms of what subsequent engagements there will be in due course as we mentioned earlier we'll also make a copy of the recording available so in case you didn't get everything you can always uh, catch up on what was discussed today as indicated, we encourage you to continue to engage with the Commission as far as your comments and questions are concerned, and we promise to get back to you. As we mentioned, we very much value this partnership. We expect that this would be uh, something which will continue uh, going forward. So on that note, we'd also like to thank very much, even though we organized this event, uh, the executive management team of the SEC for taking time to really engage and showing their commitment towards strengthening uh, the, the industry as a whole. So thank you for your time today.